If you all recall from last year's conference, Stephen Capra tells it like it is. Stephen Capra of Footless Montana is the former executive director of New Mexico Wild and worked to create two national monuments and three wilderness areas in New Mexico. He started the Mexican Wolf Coalition and worked to end trapping in New Mexico. We are excited to welcome Stephen back to close out our conference this year and grateful for his continued participation. I'll let you take it from here, Stephen. Let me know if you have any technical difficulties. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me good? We can. Thank you so much. Great. Well, first, let me apologize because uh, I unfortunately had a bad accident with a ski pole about 25 years ago, and my front tooth was removed this past week. So if you start hearing banjo music, um, you'll start to know what world I'm living in right now. Um, but uh, anyway, I wanted to uh, thank you for the opportunity. And, uh, you know, it was enjoyable to listen to your last speaker uh, with a very youthful, optimistic, wonderful kind of presentation. And I'm here now to bring you all down a little bit um, uh, because I work on the front lines uh, here in Montana, based in Missoula, uh, the whole issue of trying to save wolves. And um, I think it's important, as I always do, that I want you to understand there is so much at play here. And I think that, uh, you know, listening to the optimism of Colorado always gives me a, a tang of concern because uh, it's a little bit like leaving soldiers in the battlefield and letting them stay there and never bringing them home. We aren't taking care of the business of stopping the slaughter of wolves. And until we do that, we're never gonna be safe releasing wolves anywhere else. And that's my biggest concern for Colorado, a change in governor, a change in leadership. Uh, we don't know what direction it will go. And there's a key aspect of why that is. We as the conservation community speak in 10 to 15 voices when it comes to wolf protection. Some people want to coexist. Some people want, uh, you know, to work with ranchers. Uh, so we have this myriad of opinions on how we're best going to solve the problem of wolves. The problem with that comes into play in that ranchers, generally speaking, speak in one voice. And their voice is in opposition to wolves being on the ground. Uh, there are exceptions, and there's some people that are doing some great work. But they're few and far between when you look at the general landscape of the West. And I think that one of the things we have to understand and think about is... How is the whole community going to come together and work to save wolves? And how are they going to do that with the constraints of the competition that constantly goes on for dollars? Every group is trying to raise more money than the other on the back of wolves. But what I'm not seeing is the comprehensive cooperation needed to solve the wolf problem. Um, <clears throat> and so those are a few of my initial concerns as we talk about this. Um, and I think it's very important for people to take a look at that uh, and see how it plays out. The other aspect is kind of understanding how this is flowing state to state. Um, as you look at what's occurring in Montana, it's important to understand what got us here. Um, it got, what got us here was really, in the last couple of years, the election of Greg Gianforte to be our governor. Uh, Gianforte is a trapper. Um, he enjoys killing all kinds of wildlife, and he has absolutely no concern about wolves. In fact, he would like to eliminate them. Um, our uh, state con our congressman uh, is Matt Rosendale. Matt Rosendale is a trapper. Uh, Matt has done his best to kill as much wildlife as humanly possible, and now he represents us in Washington. John Tester, our Democratic senator, um, has spent his life on a farm, and uh, he, he was the key person that worked and begged President Obama to delist wolves in the first place with the idea that they would be brought under the jurisdiction of state wildlife management. And an incredible decision that was done through a piece of legislation. And now we sit with state agencies managing wolves, not only here in Montana, but in Idaho and uh, Wyoming. And what's the result of that? Well, the wolves are pretty much eliminated in Wyoming now as a result of this. They're in Yellowstone, but outside the park's boundaries are pretty much gone. 
In Idaho, we now have a nine month slaughter season going on. And in my state, uh, the last legislative session, which was two years ago, brought us all kinds of archaic ways to kill wolves. And we have a legislative session coming up this January where there's talk of allowing poisoning of wolves, uh, extended trapping seasons, uh, aerial gunning of wolves. Uh, and that's just the appetizer for what this legislature is prepared to do. And so that's tough sledding when you're in this environment. And in this environment, what I look at is how do we win? What are the tools I need to win? Education, absolutely critical. I've got to educate people. Um, and it's one of the ways that we go about this. We table at events. We have television commercials. We have full page ads. We have billboards. We run the gauntlet of what needs to be done to educate. And we do our own trap release workshop that goes into cities all over the state where we teach people how to free their pets if they're caught in a trap. Um, and that's been an incredible service that people request all over the state. Uh, but even as it is, the vast majority of people in this state don't even realize trapping exists. Uh, we still encounter people on a daily basis that say trapping it doesn't happen here anymore. Of course it does. And so there's a constant need to make clear to people what is going on. The second aspect is how do we work with agencies? Well, in our state, Fish, Wildlife and Parks is just turned into a rogue agency. Um, the director used to be the head of uh, Montana Outfitters. Um, he is a yes man to our governor. And everything they're doing is to try to destroy wolves and to privatize wildlife in this state, which has brought the ire of a lot of sportsmen who cannot stand the direction they see this occurring. Um, and so it's not just us that get upset, it's sportsmen, because there's a big push to turn Montana into Texas. But wolves pay the price. And wolves are the ones that, because of this cultural divide that we have in a state like Montana, um, and we have a serious culture, cultural divide, and I'm sure you'll find that in most states between urban and rural communities. And in our, in our case, um, we have rural communities that strongly uh, want to see wolves killed. I wouldn't say all of them, but there's plenty of them that do. Um, and the legislatures, the legislators who represent them um, come in eager to pass bills to do more of the killing. And so we have a Republican controlled House, Senate and governor now. So we have no checks and balances. And that creates a very difficult path. And this coming legislative session, as I said, besides all the poisoning and everything, they're going to push to make trapping part of the state constitution. We were able to hold that off two years ago by two votes. And we'll continue to push to hold that off. And we're going to also, I think, for the first time, have some Democrats willing to introduce some positive legislation for wildlife, perhaps an end to wildlife killing contests. But with the Republican majority, it will be hard to move that any further than basically hearings that we can have. On the 25th of August this year, um, we're going to have uh, a hearing uh, with Fish, Wildlife and Parks. Fish, Wildlife and Parks is going to present its plan for wolf killing next year. Now, to give you some understanding of that in the real world, what they're doing is basically saying to us that they have the same amount of wolves in Montana this year as they had a year ago. And anyone with the slightest bit of common sense knows that's not true. And ironically, Idaho says the same thing. We have the same amount of wolves. Exactly. Uh, this comes from a counting mechanism called IPOM. And IPOM is used, we're getting information from hunters and trappers. Uh, and there's a formula they use with this. Um, if you get a chance, I would strongly encourage you to read a paper by uh, Professor Scott Creel, C-R-E-E-L. He is at uh, Montana State University. Um, it's a 17 page paper that completely debunks what they're doing and shows that they're doing it all wrong and the numbers are not accurate at all. And they can't be. There's an enormous amount of poaching occurring up here. Um, and there's basically a, a, nink, a, a, a wink and a nod from uh, Fish, Wildlife and Parks. Uh, so we're in a position where we have to fight like hell 
Um, I wish we could have art shows and do other things. We can't. We spend our time in the field meeting with people and trying to understand what it's going to take to get people both engaged <clears throat> in supporting wolves and getting politically engaged. Our organization is going to have a C4 later this year so that we can endorse candidates. Uh, we can put money on the table for them and we can create scorecards. Um, all of this is vital uh, when you're in a state that is doing what it's doing and it breaks your heart. Um, what occurs on the boundary of Yellowstone is, is a disgrace to this state. And, you know, in our state last year, uh, hunting tags for wolves raised about $330,000. In our state last year, wolf watching brought in $80 million. You see the difference in that? Do you think our legislators care? They don't. doesn't mean a thing to them. They want to keep killing wolves. And next on their agenda is grizzly bears. And this is happening in Idaho. This is the, the mindset that is being pushed and pushed and pushed. A lot of scare tactics, a lot of things about wolves being the enemy. And again, as I say, the mo most of the genesis of this is the cultural divide that occurs in our state. It, you can see cars going by, say, smoke a pack a day, talking about killing wolves. Uh, the trappers have a big voice in this. But we've done a lot to knock down what the trappers are able to do. They used to brag and post pictures online. They don't do it anymore. Um, they've gotten quieter about their approach. Um, and we have worked hard to really attack how immoral and how indecent trapping is as, as a method. How immoral, how disgraceful it is to be hunting any animal on the borders of Yellowstone. And so we're on the front lines. Uh, we're there. We're working with legislators and we're doing all we can to get this public to, to begin to shift. And I see a shift. I see a shift in the urban communities. I actually see a small shift in rural communities, but it's the urban communities where I see a lot of people beginning to say, I can't stand this. Um, I, I did not move here to have this. I can't, I'm appalled by what's going on. And they're writing letters and they're calling. And, and, and this is where it gets frustrating because on the 25th of August, we have a TV commercial running right now telling people to be at the event. We're renting a bus and taking people from Missoula to the event. Um, we have done all we can to let people know this. In the end, we're going to have a strong crowd there that is going to make their case. But the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks commissioners are appointed by the governor. And with the exception of one commissioner, the others were all appointed by GM Forte. They know their marching orders. We'll get something out of this deal, but we won't get what we, we honestly need. And that is an end to the killing of wolves. I am not a supporter of wolves being killed, having a season to make ranchers feel better that they can kill some wolves. I'm a person that believes that they need to be defeated and wolves need to be on the ground. I don't take lightly what's occurring in the West. I don't take lightly at what we see from some politicians who continue to push this message of taking control of federal public lands and eliminating animals like wolves and grizzly bears. And I think we have to stand up and stand up strong. I don't apologize for the way I feel. I feel that everybody needs people to understand enough is enough. The example I'll give you, and I probably did last year, was how things were in New Mexico. Um, for me personally, um, I had to work on those two national monuments. A lot of that meant meeting with ranchers to try to find common ground on the boundaries. And I can tell you on the boundaries of our uh, Southern proposal in Las Cruces. I met with ranchers for about seven years and they told me for seven years, go to hell. And they would not cooperate at all. And in the end, what I did was go back to the Senator and say, okay, we're going to triple the acreage now of the proposal and we're going to get it done through presidential proclamation. And that's exactly what happened. The ranchers could have had a proposal that was about 200,000 acres. They wouldn't take it. We wound up with 600,000 acres because enough is enough. And I think you have to take a hard line and really look at what you're dealing with. 
if you want wolves to live and if you want them to be part of the wild, then we have to be stronger and we need to be more unified in our voice. We can't have 15 proposals for this. And I can't have a small organization like myself putting TV, uh, like my organization, Footless Montana, and putting TV commercials on at enormous cost for a small organization and not having any national groups invest a nickel in television commercials to educate the public. Imagine what some of the major national uh, conservation groups could do if they came into Montana and invested a half a million dollars in television commercials. I can tell you that we could we cover the airways pretty good for about a month for twenty or twenty five thousand dollars. Imagine what you could do with a half a million. Imagine what you could do with billboards. Imagine what you could do in outreach. None of it is occurring. It is up to small groups like ourselves to do what we can to get the message out. And I think that's a disgrace. I think that in Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana, there needs to be a hard hit of really engaging the public and saying enough is enough with the killing of wolves. And we can point out all the good things that wolves do to an environment. And there's still a wall. And to break that wall, you've got to get those urban communities um, in Idaho, in Montana. And I know there's not much in Wyoming, but to the extent there is, you've got to get them on board and saying, we're sick of this and it can't go on. And it's a disgrace to our state. A lot of people have talked about boycotting states. And um, I think there's definitely, uh, there's definitely a, a reason to do that. But I will tell you that in my conversations with a lot of the businesses that cater to wolves on the border of Yellowstone, what a lot of them have come back and said to me is, you know what's happening? Our businesses are getting boycotted because the people who love wolves won't come because they believe that a boycott is what needs to happen. And so <clears throat> you wind up with a kind of a, a, a mixed bag. Um, you know, other people are willing to come who don't care that much. But the people who really care are the people that are really getting involved in what's happening with the boycott. And so <clears throat> to the many small businesses in Gardner that have been crushed by the flood, um, that's not really what they want to hear right now. So for me, I look at a few things that we continue to do, and that is educate, educate, educate. And I will tell you that I personally made, uh, made it a point to meet with as many legislators as I could or people running for office this year to talk to them. And it was amazing the conversations I had. I had a, uh, a woman who was a legislator here, and I said, why on earth would you vote on everything that Representative Paul Fielder did to kill wolves when you represent an urban community? And she said, well, nobody told me not to. And that was one of those moments where I say, Again, the message isn't getting through loud enough. So we have been encouraging within the boundaries of our 501c3 to get that message to people to say, talk to your legislator, make it clear to them, this is unacceptable. And we have to continue pressuring things that way. You know, when you have successful campaigns, it's grassroots organizing. It's getting a variety of people in the community to support where you come from. And we continue to do that. We continue to work and meet with groups and gain support. But it's also the politics of what has to happen. And that's the hardball side of how this works. And again, as a nonprofit, you can only devote 30% of your time to that. But it is getting and meeting with these people and making clear to them how important wolves are uh, to the West, to the environment. And um, we spend a lot of time doing it. And I spend a lot of time doing that and meeting with people and making clear. And um, I don't know, I, I, we've, we've shown three commercials and I don't know if you guys can show those. We talked about it. I'm not sure that you can do it. I can't, but um, if somebody could show those, I think it would be informative to people to get an understanding of what a commercial can look like that we believe can make a real difference. And so if you got three minutes here, you're going to see three commercials that I think will give you an idea of what we're trying to do and leaves you wondering why, why aren't national groups investing in this to help us? Awesome. 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 Awesome.
Just play the... Wait. Yeah, go ahead and play them, Amanda. Wolves are a keystone species, essential to healthy land and wildlife. Wolves contain disease and keep herds strong. In Montana, they're strangled, trapped, hunted at night with bounties on their heads. Don't let Montana's wildlife be trapped out. Stop the senseless killing of Montana's real treasure, our wildlife. Wildlife can't vote. Contact the commissioners. Be at the August 25th meeting. Montana's wildlife is in peril. Go to footloosemontana.org for information. I'm Peter Coyote. So that that is one of them. I'd like you to see the other two because they're. I think they make a case here. In 1806, Lewis and Clark called wolves the shepherds of the buffalo. Wolves kept the herds healthy, culling the sick and old. Today, wolves keep elk healthy and prolific in Montana and Idaho. They revitalize land and waters. But there is a war on wolves. A slaughter meant to eradicate them being led by our extremist state governments. Demand that Interior Secretary Halland restore wolves as an endangered species before it's too late. Hi, I'm Peter Coyote. Please join me and help save America's wolves. This year marks the 150th anniversary of Yellowstone National Park, an area set aside to protect wildlife. But hunters and trappers are luring wolves out of the park to slaughter. In Montana and Idaho, wolves are being massacred for bounties, shot from helicopters, and entire populations are being wiped out. Wolves belong in Yellowstone and across the West. Please send an urgent message to Interior Secretary Holland. It's time to relist wolves to the Endangered Species Act so the killing will stop. Hi, I'm Peter Coyote. Please join me and help save America's wolves. Thank you. Um... I think that gives you a sense of what we've tried to do with the media. And I, I saw a great question asked me about um, uh, litigation. And obviously, we have talked uh, to as many lawyers as we can about litigation. Uh, I think if there's an avenue litigation wise that we're likely to go, because I know a lot of national groups will probably sue on the fate of the wolves. Uh, one of the things that we continue uh, to work on is starting to defeat the trappers um, in this state and what they're going at. So I've had a lot of conversations with the U.S. Forest Service and with the BLM. And one of the things I find just so ironic is, uh, I'll give you an example. We have a master plan now from the BLM on a large section of the Blackfoot River. And in that master plan, they discuss not allowing people to jump off bridges because of safety, moving campgrounds away from the water to protect the water, uh, not allowing people to stay in the campgrounds a certain amount. And there were several other kind of uh, safety oriented things. And when I spoke with the uh, regional director a few days ago, 
I said, you know, it's kind of ironic to me. I said, you are doing all this for safety, but you're going to allow trapping. And that's traps that'll be right there on the river's edge in the water. I said, there'll be high use recreation, families, people with pets. And she said, well, we can't do anything about that. You know, that's fish, wildlife and parks. And when I pointed out that there were a number of areas that the BLM had put off limits to trapping in Montana, her response was, well, that was a long time ago. We can't do that anymore. Um, these are bullshit answers. Um, and the Forest Service is no different. The Forest Service always says the same thing. And part of it is they don't want to create a new regulation. It would open up the, do, the, 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 the means for us to litigate. They know that. And so they continue to allow this. And in fact, what's happening uh, in some of our national forests now, they're requiring you to keep your dog on a leash. That's completely not the regulations of the Forest Service, but it is something that the trappers continue to ask for. And so that's an avenue we see some litigation potential in because we want to close urban interfaces off to trapping. And some of these urban interfaces go much beyond what you might imagine. And there are wolves and other wildlife in those areas. And we've got to start breaking ground and taking away from people who want to torture and kill wildlife, their ability to do it. The other thing that I think is really important to understand is the trophy, trophy hunting industry. Safari Club International, the Sportsman's uh, for Wildlife Conservation. These are groups that are putting millions of dollars in the coffers of senators, congressmen, and are working very hard. And the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation falls under this category. They're really pushing hard to make sure that wolves are killed. Um, we, we have the Foundation for Wildlife Management that started over in Idaho that first put bounties on wolves. They were at our legislature two years ago. Bounties on wolves appeared in Montana. Uh, they're basically a group of trappers that likes to go out and collect their own bounties. And they got ran into trouble because they, on the board of that group, were getting most of the bounty money. But what they do is a uh, bait and switch with the state governments. They come in, say, we'll pay for this. And a couple of years later, what winds up happening, as it did in Idaho and will here, I'm sure, this legislative session, they then say, Fish, Wildlife and Parks will pay for it. And so the state gets in the bounty business. These are all precursors to what could happen in Colorado. And that's why it's so important to eliminate it from happening here. If we're going to really save wolves, we've got to save them in places like Montana, in places like Idaho, even though the odds seem stacked against you. It's pennies on the dollar that national groups could be investing in this to help us get this done. And it's really shameful that it's not occurring. Everything doesn't happen in Washington. But one thing that happens in Washington is the fact that the former state director of Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks is now the director of US Fish and Wildlife Service. And Martha Williams was no hero to wolves. She was no hero to the endangered species idea. Um, and she worked very hard to remove endangered species protection for grizzly bears here. She didn't succeed, but she moved in that direction. She will be the linchpin of the decision on wolves here in Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. And I mean, with that in mind, I, I have questions about what she may do. I'm hopeful because I think the evidence is overwhelming that too many wolves are being killed. But Senator Tester, Senator Daines, who has no friend of the environment, both enthusiastically supported her, and now she's in this position of power. And in fact, does not have the qualifications that the director of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service should have, which is a degree in wildlife biology. She is a, an attorney and did not have any wildlife background. So she is unqualified to run the agency, and there she is in this position of power. So again, I'm not here to depress you. I'm really not trying to do that. I'm, I'm trying to inform you. I'm trying to give you as much information as you can get in your hands because information is what helps make a difference when we're working on these issues. I'll give you another great statistic that I think is really important to understand. 
I hear this all the time when I'm around agency officials, congressmen, uh, or when I'm around sportsmen. Sportsmen pay for wildlife. And that comes from the Pittman-Robertson Act that I think most people should be familiar with. There's an 11% surcharge on guns and ammunition. Well, we did some research on that. And what you discover is uh, that 11 that 11 contribution, only four percent, only four percent of that comes from hunters. The rest comes from recreational shooters, people who like to target practice, who like to go to a gun range, whatever. Only four percent comes from hunters. So ninety six percent of that Pittman Robertson money is not coming from people who are out in the field hunting. I think that's a really important statistic to understand, given the power of these big organizations, these big sportsman groups who like to throw that around like every day they are the savior of wildlife. I don't see killing wildlife as conservation. Some people do. I'm not one of them. You kill it, you're not conserving it. And I don't care what you pay for it. I think it's disgraceful. And so we're working hard here to really proactively get people engaged, to find litigation routes, uh, to work with other conservation groups, to educate the public. And I, I would say down the road, educating youth is a critically important thing. We just don't have the luxury to do that at this moment. We do gear some stuff. And I'll tell you what I see the most. If you, if you go to a if you go here in Montana to a uh, farmer's market where we have a table, I think the most striking thing is we always have a stuffed dog and the stuffed dog has a trap on its leg. And I cannot tell you how many kids walk up and say, why is this? Why is this happening? And the parents then have to have a conversation with their kids and say, this is why this is. And the kids get so worried about that stuffed animal it breaks your heart because you realize they don't understand this. It doesn't make sense to them. And it is these trappers and people like this that are so degraded in their mind, so sick that are allowing this kind of stuff to continue. And they threaten and they do everything they can to intimidate. And I don't give a damn about their intimidation. I care about getting them off the face of this earth and ending this in our lifetimes because it is wrong, it is sick, and it leads to violence in homes and violence with youth and violence uh, uh, with women. And it is an unforgivable thing that we are witnessing and allowing to continue. And I think one of the ways we have to look at this is if we continue to allow these people to trap animals, we're supporting domestic abuse. We're allowing mental illness to run amok. And it has to be stopped. So we spend a lot of time talking about that to people, about the fact that these people are not normal people. I, I saw a picture not long ago of a family um, having a picnic, and there were two animals trapped behind them. And the guy was a trapper, and he thought it was totally fine to leave them in the trap and have a picnic with his family. These are not normal people. These are people that have to be removed from being allowed to do what they do. And we're working on it every day. We're working hard. We're working in a very tough, I, I have to say, I've worked in some tough environments. Uh, I worked on the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge for years. Uh, I worked on wilderness and national monuments in New Mexico. This is a tough assignment. And it is an assignment that I am thankful to be a part of because I want to make a difference because I don't have a lot of fights left in me, but this is one I want to win and I need everybody's help. We need us all working together and we need the big conservation groups to invest in these states before they start going out and trying to get another state to have wolves. We need to safeguard what we have and we need to fight like hell to do it and we need to do it in a unified way. So, I know that I could go on a lot longer. I don't think I really need to. I think that you understand where I'm coming from. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here. And I welcome any questions anyone has. 
Even as always, a wonderful presentation and a special talent to just talk on the fly like that. <laughs> um, there are quite a few comments and questions, so let's let's jump into it. Um, so you mentioned the study by Scott Creel. Where can we find that? What was the title of that paper? The paper is called um, Methods to Estimate Population Sizes of Wolves in Idaho and Montana. You know, if somebody wants to email me, I'll be happy to send the report to them. Um, just at, email me, Stephen, at footloosemontana.org, and I will forward the report. Like I say, it's about 17 pages. I've spoken yeah. to Professor Creel, great guy, um, <laughs> really wants to see this come to an end and blows apart what the state agencies are saying. There you go. Somebody found it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. Um, how do you stay hopeful and motivated to keep going while being such a vocal minority in such a hostile state? Um, you know, it's challenging at times, but most of the time, you know, um, we just hired our first employee um, this weekend. Um, and, you know, it was so great to talk to him because he's he's younger than me. He He doesn't have my experience. So he doesn't have my prejudice. And so I was able to listen to his thoughts and go through it. And I'm like, it's good. And when I meet people, people come up to me and just thank me so much. And I'm not doing, I'm doing the best I can, but I'm not the savior. I'm just the person lucky enough to be working on something that really means so much. You know, it's in my heart. That's a really great answer. And one that just gave me shivers. So thank you so much for that. And if you look in the chat and some of the questions, um, there's been a lot of gratitude that has been directed towards you that I hope that you can take some time to read. Um, more questions coming at you. Do you work across state lines with similar groups seeking to stop trapping? What can people from outside of the state do to help? Great question. I can tell you that, for example, um, our hearing on the 25th, I, I have several people that are coming from California to testify. Um, that's how determined they are. They make me look like small potatoes. I mean, uh, they are coming all that way because it means so much to them. Um, we do reach out and I do communicate with groups in other states. Um, we share ideas. We talk about strategy. Um, there hasn't been so much working together on something, though I have suggested it. Um, uh, and I continue to, um, that I think, we, and I will say that those first two commercials you saw, we ran those in Idaho and Washington State uh, and Wyoming in addition to Montana. And we did it to because there's so many people in that area that care so much about Yellowstone wolves. And I'm sorry, there's some graphic aspects to it because it makes me sick to look at. But um, we're really trying to get people to understand the seriousness of what's going on here. So, yeah, there's a there's a constant conversation. What's been missing is people saying, let's unite together and put our resources together to really expand this. And that's something that's really frustrating to me. That kind of leads into the next kind of follow-up question from Allison. Hunters and livestock owners have one message, kill wolves, while advocates compromise to varying degrees. Is there a round table to create a common message to protect our wolves? Or is there a concerted effort being led for that one message? Well, I, again, I've advocated this for years. I, I, it drives me crazy. I mean, it's the single biggest flaw in how we work. You cannot continue to have 10 different viewpoints on this. And um, you can't say, oh, it's okay if some wolves die. I, I mean, maybe you can. Maybe that's something you're comfortable with. I'm not. Um, we have to stop it. And, and um, I'd be happy to be at a roundtable with a number of conservationists I'm not interested in getting a round table with a bunch of ranchers and others. I don't see it as viable. Uh, we lose a lot of ground up here in Montana because they constantly, the, what the senators want is to have you get together with loggers and miners and everything and find this common ground. And it's a loser for conservation. And if you do that with wolves, it will be a loser for wolves. You fight like hell. That's what you do and you win. Um, that's what I'm paid to do. I'm not paid to lose. I'm paid to win. 
And it's that simple. And that's how I see it. Right. Thank you for that, Stephen. That definitely enlists a sense of, um, yeah, that's stakeholder, right? We're all stakeholders in this. Um, and I will ask this of Amanda. Um, Barbara Joy asks if she could get some links to the commercials. And Amanda, if you could put the links to the three commercials that were shown earlier um, in the chat for Barbara Joy, that would be lovely. Um, Stephen, why, uh, what can we do for Idaho, Wyoming, and Montana from out, well, out of state? Once again, what organizations need to get involved by name so we can contact them? Well, I think that, you know, what you can do is invest in some of the smaller groups that are here. I mean, there's groups right. like ours. Uh, Western Watersheds is doing good things here. Um, you know, there are groups that I think can make a difference here. Um, there's groups in Idaho that are working on the wolf issue. I, I, I don't have it specifically at the top of my head. And there are other groups that are working on the wolf issue here. Um, Sometimes, like I said, it'd be great if we just work together instead of this, like competing all the time. It drives me a little crazy, but that is the nature of this business. It's, um, you know, there's a, there's a, there's not a big enough pool for everybody to be comfortable. And, um, and so I, 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 I encourage you to invest in small organizations, organizations that have, you know, under a half a million dollars, that's small these days. Uh, when you have these mega groups um, that have 20, 30 million dollar uh, budgets and, you know, aren't spending a nickel of it to educate and advertise like we need to really get people. Our organization is small. We're going to have two more commercials between now and Election Day. Um, and as I said, we'll have our C4. We are going to make the case for wildlife and getting people engaged. And believe me, we're not a big group. I am begging and begging donors to get me that money to get it up um, so that we can educate the public. And that's what we do. Um, and, and, you know, we've had a great response from a, a number of people who say that I want to see that. I'm sick of seeing these commercials, you know, that are just anti-wolf or seeing these things from trappers. People don't want to see it. And we have to we have to be on the offense, offense, offense. You know, when I'm in the legislature, I'm going to have to do a lot of defense, but I am going to make sure we have some offense when we get in there and we have some bills that come out and we start getting attention to, you know, ending wildlife killing contests, doing things that are just basic things. You start with the basics and you work on things like eliminating certain areas from trapping and all the while you continue to build that progress by having those coalitions and working with other people in communities and beginning to make that voice be a difference. And that's, that's what you do and you do it every day. To go along that point, Stephen, Linda Shaw asks, why don't beneficiaries of those $80 million from Yellowstone have more political clout? Are they unaware or not lobbying for their own benefit? I think that, all the, the businesses down in the Yellowstone area have made clear how important it is. What it really is, is uh, kind of what I would describe as sort of the Trump era reality we deal in sometimes. Uh, we have uh, a governor who wants to act like a gunslinger, tough guy. And you can put all the money in front and say, this is the money coming here. And it's like, I don't care. It's irrelevant. And so rather than try to build on that support and say, geez, if we're making 80 million and we made some more investments, maybe we could be making 200 million or 300 million. Um, they would rather just um, continue to give away to the livestock interest money, um, allow the killing of animals because it feeds that small segment uh, of people that die hardly support what he's doing. And that's more important to him at the end of the day. And it's it's disgraceful. And you have the same thing going on in Idaho. You know, we have this woman running against uh, uh, against Cheney in Wyoming. I mean, she's a total fanatic about getting rid of public lands, uh, things of that nature. This is this sort of xenophobic, anti-wildlife, anti-public land segment that is gaining far too much strength 
And part of it is because we're not fighting back hard enough. We have to beat them at this game. They don't get to win over and over again. And we have to fight like hell to change it. They don't get to win over and over again. I want I want to reiterate that point. That is so important. That is so important, especially now. Um, tell me why the Biden administration isn't doing more. I This well, is from Linda. Linda says she was hopeful that Secretary Hallen would champion wolves on this issue, but doesn't seem like she's doing enough for the Northern Rockies population. You know, something... Uh, we put a letter together that we're going to start sending to uh, all the different groups around the states. Um, it's a sign-on letter asking President Biden to use his executive powers to ban trapping on public land. Um, the letter is going to go out this week. Um, it's an example of something. Uh, Deb Hallen seems to be stuck in a, a one dimension, and it's working with tribes. And I thought that she would have uh, much more. Uh, at this point, I would I would thought there would be new monuments created. Uh, I'm very disappointed at where that's heading. And I'm hopeful that there will be a surprise somewhere in this mix. Um, and, you know, I think it's important that we work with tribes. I'm not downplaying that one bit. I'm just saying I want to see something more coming out of that interior department, you know, um, and she was my representative when I lived in New Mexico. I've met her. Um, I'm surprised. Uh, I think she's dealing with the overwhelming way in which government works. And I think it's a, it's a very slow grind. And I think that, um, but I think that the Biden administration should learn from the past few weeks. And I put a lot of the blame with uh, Ron Klein, his uh, chief of staff. I think he's been very bad. He's not environmentally in tune. Um, at those worst days of Biden, they should have been creating monuments and doing pro-positive things for wildlife. And that would have been something the public would have really appreciated. Biden still has that chance. And maybe as he gets a little tailwind here and feels a little better, it'll be an opportunity. Uh, as we know, he seems to care about dogs, seems to care about his pets. And I know the pressure that he will face from people like John Tester not to do that. And it's people like John Tester, who's a Democrat, who should be on board, but he's not. And he needs more convincing in this equation. He won't meet with me. They def I, I have tried to set up numerous meetings. They won't meet with me. So, you know, I'm not going to have that conversation with him. Um, and, um, you know, I've, take, I've challenged him a bit in the press and said, why aren't you doing this job? Why aren't you standing up for wolves? Um, and the old answer is, well, I'm an old farmer and I have my beliefs that way. No, you don't need to have those beliefs anymore. They're, they're archaic beliefs. And if we're gonna really get wolves back in the mainstream, and I think some of you have seen some of these great things that have been written in the last few days about more wolves and more beavers getting out on our public land. That's what we need to be talking about. That's what we need to be demanding. It's not, please, let us have a few wolves, have a hunting season, we'll work with everybody in the community. No, it's like, let's do what's best for the environment. Let's do what's best for wildlife. And let's start making politicians know that's what we will accept. We speak in one voice for them. They can't speak, we are their voice. Well, what a wonderful way to wrap up this conference, Stephen. Thank you so much. And um, before I pass it over to Steph to close this out, I just want to ask about this sign-on letter that you're talking about, as I'm sure some of the participants here are probably interested in. Is this yes. letter going to be open to the public to for sign-on? And where can they find that? I, we will put it up on our website, and I will be sending it to NGOs of groups all over the country and asking for them to sign on. And so, yes, I want a big, broad audience that says, President Biden, you can do this. And, um, and we will get that up in, a, in the next few days. And um, I, I certainly want you guys to help in this process. It's what we need. We need a change of attitude. We need to get bold and we need to be bold for wildlife.